Hey everyone, welcome to Locked on Lakers for Friday. Brian Kamenetsky, Andy Kamenetsky. The Lakers are giving thanks that LeBron James may be back for this weekend's set against the Spurs. Pat Beverly, not so much. That's next. You are Locked on Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team every day. Thanks to everybody for making Locked On Lakers your first listen of every day, Monday through Friday, no matter how or where you get your podcasts, always free, never behind a paywall. Locked On Lakers on YouTube is where you go to get the show, generally speaking, a little bit earlier than the straight audio product. Plus, you get to watch us do it, do a lot of fun things with visuals and make it worth your while to uh, to, to, to subscribe to the Locked On Lakers YouTube channel. Uh, thanks to everybody for making that channel grow as fast as it has. Uh, participating in the comments section. We try to weave those into our shows whenever we can. Um, so, yeah, thanks to everybody for doing that. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. The Lakers, uh, Andy, they hope to be giving thanks uh, for some continued good play, uh, perhaps with LeBron James coming back in the lineup against a slumping San Antonio Spurs team, back-to-back games both in San Antonio, a very rare occurrence. Um, but that's this weekend. And we're going to get a lot into LeBron, what it means for him to come back, how it works with Anthony Davis, who has played so well, uh, whether that momentum can continue. But a bit of housekeeping, we learned while we were on our Thanksgiving holiday that Patrick Beverly, thanks to his, what would you call it, a check to the back of De- uh, DeAndre Ayton in, in Tuesday's game? Uh, he uh, trucked him, quite frankly. Okay, he trucking, absolutely trucked DeAndre Ayton. Um uh, from behind, uh, which some members of the Suns took exception to the idea of shoving somebody in the back, because as we will get into, that is not um, an isolated incident for Patrick Beverly. The no. league uh, put down a three game suspension and in their rationale for doing so uh, noted that Patrick Beverly has a history of such behavior. Um, Repeat based, offender. Based, Based in part on Beverly's history of unsportsmanlike conduct uh, or unsportsmanlike act, said the league, uh, it's going to cost Beverly almost two hundred seventy grand in salary per uh, Bobby Marks of ESPN. Uh, you may recall too; it's not just the first time Patrick Beverly has shoved somebody in the back and gotten suspended. It's not the uh, most recently in the Western Conference Finals, two thousand twenty-one. He shoved Chris Paul in the back. So he's been doing this to sons for as long as we can remember. So, yeah, I mean, look, we all knew a suspension was coming. I will admit I, I was not expecting three games. I will also admit I'd forgotten about some of the other things. It's it's about right. I mean, you can't do that. It's very dangerous. First of all, you know, Aiden, the Lakers were lucky that Aiden didn't actually land on Reeves, who was on the ground, and Aiden kind of, stepped over him as you know as as eight as uh he was he was trucked as you said in the back we all knew he was going to get suspended that wasn't um that wasn't a question i when i saw three games i was like whoa that's a lot and then i I was like oh yeah there was like i said you know recidivist repeat offender and so the league really you know has has taken a stand on Cracking down on recidivism, uh, and you know, Pat Bev, like you said, it wasn't that long ago that he did this, you know. And I am not one of these people, and I, I just, I don't, I guess I'm not all the time or the patience who parses this person did this, this person did that, because we're talking about like individual games, like one game versus two games. It'd be one thing if some one guy got like a 17 game suspension and one guy got two. I'm not here to parse the difference between a one game and a two game, a two game and a three game. So it seems fair enough. Um, and two things about this that I think are, are worth talking about. The first one is <laughs> I loved, by the way, too. Uh, Draymond Green went on Instagram and said, quote, three games is a bit excessive, which I just love the idea of repeat offender recognizes repeat offender. Yeah. Like guys in their click, they got to look out for each other because frankly, who will? I, so the two the two things I find kind of interesting about this the first is this is the 
potentially, we'll call it the downside of the Pat Beverly experience. Um, he is going to cost the Lakers three games. Um, in a vacuum, the Lakers are not a team that can afford, whether you think Pat Bev should be playing 15 minutes a night, 25 minutes a night, or no minutes a night. Every player who the Lakers have available is important. And so Beverly cost them three games of, of his services. Um, and I was so, say, he hasn't cost them three games of anything yet other than his service. They, if they go 3-0, right. oh, who cares? Sure. But it's just like, you know, the option, we, we talk a lot about optionality because on this yeah. team it really matters. To have the ability to do different things and mix and match um, useful in some ways players, flawed in other ways players in the best way possible for Darwin. Darwin doesn't have that option. As, as critical as I've been of, of, of a lot of what Beverly's done, particularly offensively, there certainly have been moments, and we'll carry this in the second part of what I think is interesting, where he's been valuable, where he has not, you know, where he's done things defensively, where he defends in a way that is harder for other people to replicate and all that. And so on the one hand, he's cost the Lakers the option of using him for three games, three very important games, it should be noted. But on the other, to a man, the Lakers appreciated what he did that got him suspended. So, you know, in terms of a galvanizing, potentially galvanizing moment, in terms of a uh, character constructing moment or something like that, where this team is sort of developing its own fabric or whatever, so whatever the word is, this could be an important moment and a potentially positive one. Yeah, I mean, Beverly himself said after the game that he was concerned that he would get suspended. I mean, he he acknowledged whether facetiously, sincerely, or somewhere in between that this was, in his own words, unprofessional. And, you know, he's he said, quote, I'm a big boy, I'll take my lumps. However they come, definitely could have reacted in a different way. Like, he's acknowledging, I did something I'm not supposed to do. I thought it was going to be a minimum of one to two games anyway. So three does seem tacked on as the idea of, hey, Patrick Beverly, we've seen this a lot over your career, and you don't seem discouraged by the previous punishments. Maybe an extra game or so will finally get you to get the message. You know, do I think it will? Probably not. I mean, I think Patrick Beverly is very wired to be Patrick Beverly. That's just that's who he is for better and for worse. Well, it's the only way he can and, stay in the league. At 34 years old, this is how Pat Beverly stays in the league. This kind of I playing disagree. with this kind of edge. With this playing, it's, it's, playing this with is this type of edge. how he stays in the league. Right. I was gonna say, I actually think at this point in his career, Patrick Beverly is established enough that if he just played with the edge but cut out the shoving. <laughs> like he actually would be just fine. No, I, I, no, I just, agree with you. That he but I just think in his, own, in his own brain, this is how he is wired. And he's, he's too far into this. The habit is that, you know, that he can't dial it back. And only, I just don't think he's, I don't think he's capable of it because this, you know, kind of all of it is so hardwired into a guy who this isn't cliche really did have to scrape and claw and earn his sure. way into a long end. I just don't think you can unwind that. And so I, I don't mean it as Chris, I have a tremendous admiration for Beverly and people like him who carve out really long successful careers to the point, Andy, that missing three days of work is going to cost him almost $300,000 like that is a chest puffy moment for any professional. I think I would be ecstatic if I was in a position where where missing three days of my job would cost me that much money. So kudos to him for all he's accomplished. Yeah, yeah, I guess that is sort of the glass half full way of looking at it. You can say, damn, I am really, really flipping rich. But look, some of this is also just, as we've talked about the Patrick Beverly experience, and Patrick Beverly is very self-aware of the Patrick Beverly experience, of providing the Patrick Beverly experience, and making sure that everybody knows they are experiencing the Patrick Beverly experience. And, you know, like you, I say this without being critical of him for doing it, because in the moment, I didn't have a problem with it because 
He was taking up for a teammate. And this is a team that I think is still looking for galvanizing moments to gel around and unite around. And I think this could possibly be one of them. Plus, as we discuss coming up, I'm not totally sure how much the absence is actually going to affect. Well, okay, the that's that's the next reasons. thing I want to get to because the question, the next question is, are the Lakers better off? Because you and I have been critical of Beverly again, particularly on offense and the impact that he has on the offense. But the advanced numbers, for example, will tell you that his on-off impact, his plus-minus, and all that stuff, his net rating. He is one of the strongest guys on the team in terms of players who play in the rotation. I had the highest net rating of anybody. Um, I didn't look this morning, but you know, after you know heading into Tuesday's game, his net his net rating was the highest on the team among rotation players. So this is one of those moments where we're gonna see what happens and kind of which half of this equation is right. I want to see what our uh, predictions and thoughts are for how actually impacted the Lakers will be by not having Beverly around, and we'll do that next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by ExpressVPN. We all know how ExpressVPN protects your privacy and security online, but here's something you may not know. You can also use ExpressVPN to unlock movies and shows that are only available in other countries, and this is going to change your world. Just sign into Netflix, fire up the ExpressVPN app, and then change your location to whatever country, refresh Netflix, and that's it. ExpressVPN lets you control where you want sites to think you're located. You can choose almost 100 different countries, so imagine all the Netflix libraries you can go through. ExpressVPN works with any streaming service, Hulu, BBC iPlayer, YouTube, you name it, and it's ridiculously fast. ExpressVPN also works on all your devices, phones, media consoles, smart TVs, all of it. Go to Express vpn.com slash locked on right now and you can get an extra three months of express vpn for free that's express vpn.com slash locked on express vpn.com slash locked on to learn more um okay so um the other half of this equation with patrick beverly is whether or not the lakers are actually better off if he isn't available um he has had a i think a negative effect, you know, contextually on this team offensively um, because he is so, so useless on that side of the ball. I mean, it's not like he was a, an all world scorer before, but Patrick Beverly was somebody we thought would contribute to the three point shooting and score 10, 12 points a game or 15 every once in a while, whatever hit a couple three pointers a game. He still doesn't have a game where he has more than two field goals. I don't think, um, that's really bad. The Lakers have been playing four on five basically every time he's out there. So that part of it makes me think the Lakers might be better off if he didn't play. The flip side is, Andy, the advanced numbers, at least some of them, say that his overall impact on the Lakers has been positive. He, on a team where everyone basically has a negative net rating, is the leader among rotation players. So which half of this do you think is telling the story? Well, I think they both are in some respects. And I, I, I don't think the question is really, are they better off without Patrick Beverly at all? I think the real, because I think the answer is no, they're not talented enough, I think, to be able to afford to lose anybody who contributes at all. I think really the question is just how much will they miss him? To your point, he's currently having career lows from the field, uh, t- almost 27% rounding up not good. And from the three-point line, almost 24% rounding up, also not good. And you had mentioned the the best net rating on the team, despite the offense and often, frankly, the eye test. I looked up the most recent net ratings, and Thomas Bryant now has the highest of anybody in the rotation, uh, barely positive, but one. Right, but I I wasn't counting him because he hasn't played enough minutes. Well, I'm I'm, well, I'm just telling you in in terms of guys who have been in the rotation though lately and the effect he's had lately and which also makes sense because Thomas Bryant I think has played very well since he's been back he has the highest followed by Wenyan Gabriel who is mm-hmm. basically at even Patrick Beverly now is about fourth or fifth with a minus one which puts him in the upper part of the rotation players but I think it reflects a the serious 
minus 17 that he had before getting ejected against Phoenix uh, in a net rating that I can only assume was god-awful. But also, I think that he has been trending downward over the last few games in terms of that overall effect. Like, if you go to cleaning the glass or some other places, Mm -hmm. a lot of his defensive metrics are really good. He leads the team in uh, charges drawn. He's second on the team in deflections. Like ninety six percentile, ninety six percentile in points per possession. Right. There's a lot of things he's still doing well. He has not been awful or useless. And if you're asking me if I think he will be missed, the answer is to some degree yes. But they also need to try to find some more help offensively, if possible. And Dar- perhaps Darwin being. Uh, forced to reconfigure the rotation if the solution isn't just LeBron starting again. Um, Maybe Darvin has to be a little bit more creative in there. Maybe just having somebody in there that you have to account for offensively at all, whether it's LeBron or somebody else, makes a difference. Um, It's worth noting, too, defensively, Max Christie has uh, cleared the COVID health and safety protocols, so he will be back, presumably picking up some of Beverly's minutes, picking up some of Kendrick Nunn's minutes, or maybe both. Also, Juan Toscano Anderson has been upgraded to probable. And if nothing else, he might be able to help them in some ways defensively, you know, overall in in just trying to offset Beverly's absence. So Mm -hmm. I, I think he is going to be missed. It's really more a matter of just how much is he going to be missed. Both of us think he should be playing fewer minutes anyway not necessarily zero, but they should be trending in the direction of guys playing more than Beverly, the rotation operating more without Beverly anyway. So this is one of those things like, you know, how much Pat Bev plays, Um, you know, deploying Wenyan Gabriel, what you're getting out of, you know, like there are a lot of questions that are important for the Lakers. Um, But, that really become the sort of thing that separates like contending teams, you know, like when you start getting the margins and that the 3%, the 2%, the five, like how can you squeeze out every ounce of, of what a team is and what they're capable of fundamentally, what the Lakers are capable of being just as a baseline is based around Anthony Davis and LeBron James. It's really interesting. Like I I have seen three or four comments from the, uh, on the YouTube page, um, where a lot of the, the 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 commenters are saying things to the effect of like the, the Lakers can't waste this Anthony Davis. What struck me about that is it's that's a that that is something that's the sentiment that had always been taken to LeBron. Like they, the Lakers can't waste this LeBron. The Lakers can't waste this production that they're getting. People are a few people were talking about that in the context of AD, and so what the supporting cast gives you isn't as important as what Davis and LeBron give you. And now LeBron presumably is going to be back for Friday. This is the type of thing that ought to elevate the Lakers, regardless of, you know, little, you know, some of the, the, the supporting cast things. I think people are really genuinely curious though, at this point, given how dominant Davis has been, as to how the Lakers can integrate LeBron back into the lineup without taking anything away from what AD seems to have discovered. It's kind of a fascinating moment in in like this era of the Anthony Davis, LeBron James Lakers. Well, I mean, it's the question that the Lakers had been hoping to address in real time and philosophically, I think a couple of years ago. I think they were hoping that by the time this season had rolled around, they had already figured out the formula for this because it was something that was happening organically anyway. Like, you know, where, you know, we we talked about this before. Like, LeBron has been, ever since he and AD are, I mean, LeBron has been seen as a closer, period, ever since, Mm -hmm. you know, ever since he won that first title in Miami. You know, before there had been some questions about him, certainly after the 2011 uh, finals loss against the Mavericks, the the only time where LeBron has legitimately crapped the bed in the finals, like whether his team won or lost, he's never it's never been on LeBron other than that one year. LeBron has been seen as a closer. And if you look at 
their entire time as teammates over these four seasons, AD has averaged without fail more points and field goal attempts in the first quarter, regular season or playoffs. LeBron has averaged more points and field goal attempts in the fourth quarter. This includes the 2020 playoffs where we can remember dominant moments from AD. Doesn't change the fact that LeBron has been the closer. And some of that may be functional, like functional of his position and what he does, but I think some of it is expectation that everybody has and perception that everybody has of, as ultimately LeBron is the guy that's going to take us home. And lately, AD has been playing like the dude who not only is going to take us home, but I think is playing like a guy that can take them home in ways LeBron can't. So that's going to be a really interesting dynamic to try to figure out because I'm not, on a game-in, game-out basis, I don't know if AD can keep this up, but I don't think LeBron can do what AD has been doing on a game-to-game -game basis, regardless so, of whether either one of them can do it from now until the end of the season and hopefully the playoffs. All right, so I know you've been looking at some numbers. The TNT folks on Tuesday night's game put up some numbers. I've been looking at some other numbers. There's no question that the last five, you know, the, the, these stretch of games, is it five games, you know, that LeBron's missed, four games? Yep, um, five. Where, five, yeah, where, where LeBron hasn't been in there. The offense has performed significantly better. Competition hasn't been as good. Get all that. But there are a lot of numbers that, that, that speak to LeBron as a drag on the Lakers' offense. And so how do they fix that? and keep Anthony Davis going because some of these numbers are stark and we'll get into some of them next. Locked on Lakers is brought to you by Sweat Block. There is nothing worse than sweat breaking out at the absolute worst time, like at a wedding or a party, some type of festivity. You naturally want to take your jacket off, maybe that suit coat. You want to get loose, but you can't because you are just leaking from your underarm. It's unsightly. It's gross. So you end up stuck celebrating with a jacket on, looking like you're uptight because you don't want to look like the sweaty person. Nobody wants to deal with that. Sweat block wipes are your solution. Sweat block wipes work for up to seven days per use. Apply them on a Sunday and you will be dry all week. And if someone you love is experiencing embarrassing sweat or odor, there is no better way to show them that you love them than recommending sweat block. Save 20% with the promo code locked on at sweatblock.com. It's also available at Amazon. So here are just a couple numbers. Um, overall offensive rating, Russell Westbrook, Anthony Davis, both at a, about 110 points per possession, which, by the way, leads the team. Um, Two of them together have developed a nice chemistry. It was a nice chemistry, actually, that was developing last season before AD started getting hurt all the time. Um, so... You know, there there's that. Um, and then you look at their offensive ratings in these last five games with LeBron unavailable. Um, it is 119.9 for Westbrook. It is 116.1 for AD. Again, competition matters. Um, you know, you're playing, you know, the Spurs, you're playing the Nets, you're playing the Pistons, you're playing, you know, it's like it, this stuff does make a difference. I don't know but, how Russ can possibly have a higher offensive rating than AD with what AD has been doing. That's I, I it, 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 well, I mean, I no, I don't know either. <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> I'm, know. I'm, I'm just saying it's kind of crazy. And I'm, I mean, look, I believe in analytics. I think they're important. I think they, t I think the eye test is a place that can actually get people into a lot of trouble. Um, yeah, I'm not one of these anti-analytics type people. Uh, there are some times when I do. Uh, not get them. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, but to your it answer, I'm like not sure. AD's, it feels like AD's offensive rating should be like four million over these last five yeah. games. I mean, we're not talking about net rating either. It's like his actual, like you know, I can understand, like you know, the moments where he's on the floor, like off the defense. That's just offensive rating. It does yeah. seem like uh, his should be higher. Um, no single metric is perfect. These are all shorthands, blah, 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 blah. That just does seem weird. <laughs> uh, I'll copy on the side. Um, and so I, I think when you look at LeBron, whose offensive rating is 
for the season is 10 points behind ADs, whose defensive rating is, um, you know, you know, overall net rating, all this stuff is like he's he's not performing well in that regard near the bottom of the team in terms of overall net rating. Um, he's got to be better. And this is stuff that we had started to allude to. Um, the offense bogged down far too much. Um, not just him, but everyone. But a lot of that is waiting for LeBron to set up a shot. LeBron um, settling for a three, and he's shooting a ton of threes at a very low percentage. And then a lot of it is guys standing around watching LeBron do things instead of moving. So it's not all LeBron, but to the extent that it is LeBron, LeBron's got to get more efficient, and other guys got to start kind of moving and maximizing this. But LeBron can't get in the way of what AD has been doing. Yeah, it's going to be very e- it's going to be very interesting to see how this, you know, if LeBron does play tonight, how this dynamic evolves moving forward, both in the way that he looks for, you know, AD to have those type of o- offensive opportunities, the type of stuff that he looks to set up for AD, but also just the idea of LeBron needs to be a more off, uh, efficient offensive player himself. Mm-hmm. He just he. These are some numbers that were put up from uh, TNT during the game against Phoenix with LeBron. They've been averaging a little under 107 points per game without him. 119. The point differential almost minus seven with LeBron, plus 4.4 without him. Field goal percentage with him, 44 percent without him, 31. So you you get some indication overall of where you're missing LeBron, but the three-point percentage has actually been better without him. On balance, they have been better offensively, more efficient offensively. Probably in some respect, Brian, you talked about the standing around thing. You come to realize it's not one guy that's going to be playing quarterback. Like even Russell Westbrook, he's typically going to go downhill to kick out, or he's going to go downhill trying to seek contact Maybe get a layup, maybe miss. Or downhill, try to score. And if anybody's paying attention, you follow that shot because he's missing an awful lot of those. Sure, but but either way, the ball for as much as Russ can monopolize the ball, the the ball has been sticking in a much less slow way with Russ than it's been less with sticking. LeBron. It's, it's not yeah. sticking as much. Yeah, I mean the the there everything has become very static this season so far with LeBron. And it, the truth is, if if this team, you know, there's been a lot, there's always a lot of talk about the moves that they either make or don't make. Um, and the truth is, if they're going to make an all-in move, obviously this season, it's obviously going to be dictated in part by how AD is playing and hoping he stays healthy, but also to, quite frankly, LeBron. Because there's always the idea of just, doing this because you can't afford to waste LeBron. LeBron right now has not been playing at a level where you necessarily feel like it's such a crime to waste it. Yeah, it's it's and some of this to me is really about AD. Um and you look at what the Lakers have been able to do with him. He's taking 54% of his shots this season at the rim. This all this is per cleaning the glass. You know, 54% of his shots at the rim this year. That is by far uh, his highest number as a Laker, and it's his highest number since he was a rookie with the Pelicans in 2012, 2013. Um, so this would be currently the second highest mark of his career, only the second time that he has been over 50% taking shots uh, at the rim defined by cleaning glasses within four feet. Um, short mid, which is, you know, uh, that, that you know, this is a space, you know, outside four feet, inside the free throw line, basically. 27 percent that's up from 21 percent um and this i think is critical three point shots i think we all know what that is how that's defined down to seven percent of the shots that he's taking in his first year in la that was 17 percent these are all really healthy trends that explain why he's scoring as efficiently as he is why he's living at the free throw line over the last four or five games and for the Lakers to quote unquote cook, these trends have to continue. Anthony Davis, as LeBron has said, as Darvin Ham has said, as we have said, as everyone has said, 
needs to be their best player on a night in night out basis sort of statistically for the Lakers to get where they're going. He needs to be the dominant one. And so um, he wasn't at the beginning of the year. He is right now. And I'm not saying it's LeBron's fault, but the biggest change is the presence or absence of James. And so, like I said, these next two or three games, four games, hopefully uh, with LeBron back on the floor, it's nice that it happens against San Antonio, even in their building, because bad teams allow you have a chance to build up this stuff. But, man, if things go back to a really bad offensive team, Andy, if Anthony Davis goes back to being that, oh, where's that that dude? People are going to start looking at LeBron as as what? as the the difference here. The the last thing I would say with LeBron uh, before we go is, I mean, obviously the solution is not j- simply make more shots, do it better. Because if it was that simple, uh, I have faith in LeBron I that he would just start doing it better. Not bench LeBron. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is clearly not it either. Um, you know, obviously there are reasons where there are reasons why. LeBron has not been scoring at an efficient clip as he had in the past. Maybe it's related to the foot issue he's been dealing with. Maybe it was, was related to not fe- sick. All yeah. you know, and there's also the age factor. Whatever. The one area where I think LeBron can be immediately better is his decision making. His decision making to start this season before the groin injury sidelined him. To be totally honest, has not been very good. He's mm-hmm. often thrown risky passes whether they're turned over or not his shot selection i think to put it generously has been settling um there there is a lot where somebody like lebron who is inarguably one of the smartest players to ever play this game beyond one of the best players to ever play this game he can simply make better decisions and i think making better decisions alone will help in some respect with that efficiency we're talking about. Yeah. And hopefully a more dominant Davis both makes his decision tree easier. Um, yeah. And it takes a lot of, it takes some of the, the pressure off of him to perform and dominate in that way every single night, which I do think is a reason um, that some of the, the efficiency goes down where he puts too much on himself or, you know, so you you want that sort of symbiotic relationship to develop where Anthony Davis makes LeBron's life easier, le- makes LeBron better, which makes Anthony Davis's life easier. Um, and that's what the Lakers are needing. So we'll see what happens on Friday, presuming LeBron plays. Uh, hopefully he's able to play Saturday as well. Uh, and going forward, Locked on Lakers on YouTube is where you go to see the show. Uh, often again, before the audio folks get a chance to, uh, to hear what's going on. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for subscribing. Tell a friend to subscribe, particularly if that friend is a Laker fan, and we will see everybody next time.